Holy Spirit is important in our lives because the Holy Spirit helps us to know what to do and brings comfort in our lives when, when we don't know what to do. The Holy Spirit empowers us to know God's will for our lives and gives us strength when we're weak and comfort when we're sad and helps us to understand things that, that we might not understand otherwise. I grew up in church all my life. My granddad was actually Baptist, but my church was Methodist because that was where, you know, it was just the one that was in our community. I ended up going to the Assemblies of God Church and, you know, marrying an Assembly of God guy and going to Bible College and at Assemblies of God Bible College <laughs> and just trying to learn everything I could about the Holy Spirit, but then I never, I still had never been filled with the Spirit to speak in tongues. I knew it was the right thing and I just kept praying and I pray to be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues and it just would never happen. Then I, I guess that went on for about 10 years, you know, my, I started having a family, I've got my kids in the church, I'm just serving God and trying to honor Him with everything I did, but then there started to be a lot of struggles in our lives, in my marriage. I was in this children's crusade and the, the children's evangelist was asking for children and adults, if they hadn't been filled with the Spirit, to come forward. So I just, you know, I prayed and I prayed, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with your Spirit. And it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. But the next day I went back to Ricky and Jenny's apartment in Memphis and we were having to stay there because basically I was homeless at the time and nobody was home and I knelt down and I just started pouring out my heart to the Lord and just telling him you know how I felt and I just said Lord just fill me with your spirit because I have nothing else I don't know I don't know what I'm to do right now but all I all I have is you. And I started speaking in tongues. And it was, it was, it was just like it was easy. I mean, it was like all of a sudden everything just starts to happen. And all of the prayers that my heart couldn't pray were coming out of my heart through the Holy Spirit. I could just feel that that was what was going on, you know. And I felt so much peace. I can't even, I can't even put it into words. One thing that changed about me that I could tell a difference right away was the way I saw other people. Because when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, suddenly I didn't see everybody because of their flaws. I saw everybody because of their needs. They needed Christ. They needed the Holy Spirit in their hearts. They needed the love of Christ to help them through their hard times. So it was it was just a it was a big time for me to change who I was, how I saw myself and my role in the world. I hope that you received one of these when you came into the room. It's a little uh, GI Joe man, a little army guy, military personnel. And uh, this coming Thursday is Veterans Day, and I want you to take one of these, if you didn't get one, to get one before you leave. And I just want you to be in prayer for our veterans, for our military who are home and abroad, that, you're, that God's hand would be up on them this morning. If you're here today and you are a veteran, if you served or are serving currently, I just want to ask you if you would to stand to your feet today. We just want to honor you this morning. Is there anyone in the room who is a veteran? All right. Got a few in the room today. We say thank you. For your service, we enjoy the freedoms we have today because of you and folks like you. So make sure you pick up one of these little guys uh, or girls. I don't know. Their hair may be tucked into the helmet. But uh, we want to encourage you to pick up one and put it where you see it. And let's offer prayer constantly for those who serve in the United States military. Amen. Hey, um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. 
Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. That's where we're going to go today. Let's have a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Uh, I'm so thankful, Lord, for what you've already done in the first service. I thank you, Lord, uh, for your words spoken. I'm so thankful, Lord, for what you're going to do in this service. And I just ask, Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive what you have for us and that you would be glorified and praised today. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, as far as the remotest part of the earth. Values. Values. What's important to you? What's become your standard for how you live your life? You know, six, six weeks ago, I stood on this platform and began a series on fundamentals. And we began with the fundamental or the value of being Bible-based. Pointing our attention, giving ourselves, positioning ourselves for the, to the Word of God. Focusing on the Word of God. Followed by Christ-centered, growth-minded, outward-aimed, people-focused, and last week, prayer-driven. Each being a fundamental, each being a value from God's Word that drives how we are to live every single day. You know, values are taught. Did you know that? They're taught. They're taught directly. You know, those who have children in the room, those who have kids, there, there are things, there are lessons that you constantly pour into their lives. Whether it be you see a behavior in them and you pull them aside and you begin to invest in them personally by speaking things into their life. This is the reason why. This is the reason why not. Uh, all of those things. Those are things spoken into them. And, and we're, we're trying to teach them something that we have learned, right? We're trying to invest in their lives. And, and those are taught. So values can be taught, but they're also taught indirectly, not just directly. With values creating this culture. A culture in your home, a culture in your life, a culture in your church, and even a culture within the community in which we live. You've heard me say every week, almost every week, if you show me the value in your life, if you show me your values, what you believe, what you hold to be true, then I will show you what kind of life that you will live. There's going to be a result that comes about apart from, because of your life and the values that you choose to uphold. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 12 in verse number 33. Either make the tree to be good as well as its fruit good, or make the tree to be bad as well as the fruit bad. And he ends with this. He says, for the tree is known by its fruit. The tree is known by its fruit. What he's saying is, if there's good in there, then good is going to come out. But if you've made the tree bad, if the tree is bad, then it's also going to bear that bad fruit. Meaning that fruit will come forth, either good or bad. An apple tree produces apples. That's, that's just part of nature. A pear tree produces pears. Amen? Well, values shape a culture. They shape a culture. You don't have to look long or watch the news or, or read a paper to know that society, society is slowly diminishing. We're seeing society change in front of us from where we used to be. The world will promote it as a banner of being progressive or moving forward or accomplishing new things. And that's fine. I'm all about new things. But what, what I see is when evil is called good and good is called evil, we've lost our way. That's a good place for an amen. When evil is called good and good is called evil, we've lost our way. Jesus said, there's a good and there's a bad. And you have to decide what that fruit will be. Based on the tree, based on the value, based on what you choose to hold as a core value in you. That, my friend, begins with the question, what do I value? What do I value in life and how will I live? As we conclude our series this week, I'm finishing not with the least important core value, lesser than the others. I'm finishing with the one who helps you make all the others possible, spirit-empowered. Today has been about spirit empowerment. It's about 
looking to the one, the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us as a church and how He impacts our life. Living free, giving this definition, the Holy Spirit is given by God to indwell, to lead, and to empower each believer. See, I grew up Pentecostal. Ever since I was 10 years of age, I stepped into a Pentecostal church. Living free, the church you're in this morning is a Pentecostal church affiliated with the Assemblies of God, the largest Pentecostal church on the globe, 70 plus million strong. I don't say that to boast this morning, but I say that for you to understand that you're a part of something larger than yourself, that you're a part of something that shares the same values as you share this morning. It's just not the few that may find itself in this room or in the service previous to this one, but it's multiple people across Tennessee, across the United States, and around the world, 70 plus million who embrace these same type of values, who look to the Word of God for these answers. Historically, Pentecostal churches have been all over the map. If you've been to a a Pentecostal church from time to time, you may have seen that. I'm not referring just to the Assemblies of God, but to many other denominations and independent works who carry that label or claim to be Pentecostal. Well, just like there are different versions within specific denominational communities, there are also all types of versions that we see inside the Pentecostal community. That's important to highlight because generally society is known as lumping everything under one label. It lumps it under one banner. Well, this is a Methodist church that we heard on the video. or This is a Baptist church, but this is a Pentecostal church. You see, I saw a, a lot of strange things growing up. I saw some things that, uh, that I can't verify necessarily. And when I tell people that uh, I am from an, a, Pente- a Pentecostal church, they'll say, oh, you're Pentecostal. Oh, you're, you're Pentecostal. Drawing a quick conclusion of me either because of the visit to a so-called Pentecostal church or from secondhand information that they've, re- uh, they've seen. See, growing up in a Pentecostal church, as I said, I've seen all types of things. I've seen things that were genuinely a move of God, meaning that there were good things that were taking place in the lives of those who were there and good things taking place in the lives of people. But I've also seen things that were not so good, some things that I would consider man-made on some level where we allow things to happen that shouldn't necessarily happen. I've seen all kinds of stuff take place. You know, you've heard the stories. We, 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 we hang from chandeliers and we run the back of, uh, of pews. And I'm not saying that, that I haven't seen some of that. Not a chandelier, that's a little high. But um, we've seen all kinds of things happen. And what it is, it's emotional. It's emotional responses that take place inside the house of God. Well, to know God has good things for His people is also to know that the enemy has imitations as well. Imitations that he brings into the house of God with imposters exploiting God's people for their benefit. You see, how do I make that determination? How do I say that these things have happened inside of, and I'm not just saying this church. I'm saying that in any church, how do we make those distinctions that there are things that are happening inside of church houses that should not be the word of God? That's how I make that distinction. And that's how I want you to make that distinction today as the people of God. It's the Word of God that helps us to know what is right and what is wrong. What is good and what is bad. Jesus told His listeners in Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and provide great signs and wonders. I want you to catch that. That false prophets and false Christs will come in and introduce great signs and great wonders. Where is that taking place? Most times in a Pentecostal church. Great signs and great, great wonders taking place. Blinded eyes opening. People's leg lengthening. Lives being changed in the miraculous. Those things have been seen. Those things have been documented. Those things have happened because of the moving of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person. Those things continue to happen. We see it in Jesus' day. We laid hands on the blind and they were recovered. He laid hands on, the, on, the, on those who were, who, were, who were lame and they got up and began to walk. 
These are things because of God moving in the hearts and lives of individuals and on their physical bodies. But there will be a time when false prophets and false teachers will come in and provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Those who've been in this thing for a long time. Those who understand and even to some degree have a grasp on Scripture. But to deceive even the very elect. Behold, he's saying in verse 25, I have told you in advance. That's the beauty of Jesus. He didn't just leave it uh, to us to experience and say, well, good luck. He's saying, I'm telling you something is going to come down the pike with time and you're going to need to be aware of it. I'm telling you now so that you'll know when it comes. So that you'll understand. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Paul told Timothy this, For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. People who want what they want, not necessarily what God wants to do in their life. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. What is truth? God's word is truth and will turn aside to myths. See, how did Paul instruct Timothy to overcome that type of deception? Well, what I just read you is from verses 3 and 4. But verse 2, he says this to Timothy, preach The word. Preach the word. Understand the word. And it's the word of God that teaches us what is right and what is wrong. It helps us to make the tree good. And when we don't follow it, it's easy to allow the tree to become bad. You see, it's from God's word that we have the ability also to understand this person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And how he moves in our lives. Beyond emotions being outwardly expressed, which he, the Holy Spirit, does. Come on. If you can celebrate and raise your hands at a football game and cheer them on, you can do the same for Jesus in the church house. (laughs) Amen. We can celebrate God here today. And I want that. I want us to celebrate him. I want us to clap our hands. I want us to shout with a voice of triumph. I want us to celebrate all that God is doing in our lives when we come into his house. I want it to be from a pure emotion. I want it to be because it's what God is doing and what we see. Where some of us, we just may fall to the ground and begin to weep because we're reminded of who He is in our lives and what He's done. We may weep silently at an altar or we just may raise our hands as an act of surrender and just find ourselves being lost in His presence in that moment. Some may be so excited that you just may have to do a little run, you know? But it's all generated from a pure heart that just loves Jesus and you just can't stand still. I've seen people, it just well up in them. They just begin to dance because of what God has done in their life. True emotion, true worship. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. Do you remember that in Scripture? And he stripped down to his skivvies. Everybody thought he was crazy. But he said, I will even become more undignified than this. When questioned. Because I love my God. And I'm going to express myself before him because he is my God. He's the one that changed my life. He is my everything. So I'm going to celebrate him with all of my might. We can do that in the house of God. And I encourage that in the house of God. Let us do it for Him. For Him. For who? For Him. It's all about Him. But more than being emotional is being biblically sound. Is being biblically sound. And understanding the Word of God. When we're biblically sound, then and only then will we know how to conduct ourselves in private and in public worship. Then and only then will we discover what God has made available for His people to accomplish His purposes in the world. You see, there's a reason why the person, the Holy Spirit, has come. And there's also a reason why the gift of the Holy Spirit was given. There are reasons why God does what He does. It's not just for us to be tickled. It's not just for us to have goosebumps. It's not for us just to say, Woo, we had a good time in church today. It's more than that. There's a reason why the person of the Holy Spirit is in your life. And there's a reason why He gives you a gift and gifts to be used and accessed from the kingdom of God in this place that we call earth. There's a reason that He does those things. 
Why was the Holy Spirit given? Well, I want to give you two certainties, and then we're going to wrap up today. And here's the first one if you're taking notes, if you have a notes page. The Holy Spirit was given to indwell and lead. The Holy Spirit was given to indwell and lead. The Holy Spirit is a person. He was given to us by the Father. He is the third person in the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not found in Scripture. It's not there. But we see from the pages of the Bible that He was in the beginning, moving over the face of the water in Genesis chapter 1. And He's the last person in Revelation 22 that offers up a prayer. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He is from beginning to the end. He is present with God the Father and God the Son. When they stood and said, let us make man, let us make man in our image. He was there. The Holy Spirit moved upon the disciples, moved throughout the early church, performing miracles and performing all of the things that we see written in Scripture. He was a huge proponent in the early church. He is a person sent by the Father to take up residence in the lives of those who have come to place their trust and their faith in Jesus. He causing dead things to come alive, mainly your spirit within. Romans chapter 8. I encourage you to read the whole chapter when you go home today. It's all about the Holy Spirit and what He does in your life as He indwells the new believer. He's given to us at that moment of faith. He comes into our lives. He allows the Spirit to awaken. He allows our life to be pointed all of a sudden to Jesus and say, Wow, this is who He is in my life. This is who I've always meant, He's always meant me to be. It's the Holy Spirit doing that work in our life as He indwells. Because the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in your life, you have an obligation to listen and obey the Holy Spirit. Which means that He leads. He leads our life. When you listen, there's life. But when you choose to follow the old self, what you were saved from, what you came out of that that life of, 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 of bad tree or bad fruit or whatever, when when you choose to walk out of that and trust Jesus with your life, the Bible says uh, that 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 you die if you don't choose if you continue to choose to follow the old self. You die. You're either going to live because of the Holy Spirit or you will die by following you. You see, Paul saying in Romans chapter 7, I find within me a fight to do good as a disciple of Jesus, but in the same time, my old evil evil nature being present. Meaning that there is something inside of me. Anybody relate to that? Anybody in the room? Am I just up here talking to myself? I relate to that. Because there's an evil nature inside of me. It's the old nature. It's this man that is in me that wants to, to, wants to swell up when things don't go the way I think they should go. But yet it's the Holy Spirit who stands in our lives because He's made us new. He's brought us to this relationship with God, waking our spirit up, helping us to come alive in God. And because He's in there, because He's indwelling, He's leading our lives and He speaks to us in those moments. It's not like the the little angel on one shoulder and the devil on another shoulder that tells you they're whispering in your ears telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But it's the Holy Spirit who reminds you of something. He reminds you of what? He brings you back to the Word. He brings you back to the truth. He brings you back to the place of you understanding why you would not do X for a reason. It's not like you just shouldn't do that. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. He tells you why. He helps you to understand in those moments. Bringing you back to a place to where... How many has ever wanted to say something you shouldn't say? Anybody? Or in these days, post something that you shouldn't post. Well, I'll teach them. (laughs) We're just going nuts. And for a brief moment, we went insane, you know? We just let it all out. But it's the Holy Spirit that just doesn't say, don't do that. He says, why we shouldn't do that? And he brings us back to the word that says, you know, this is what Jesus said. And this is how we should respond. 
We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We should treat others how we're supposed to. We should prefer them. If our enemy smikes our cheek, we should turn the other. However it applies, we, the, the Scripture is full of how we engage others in life. Are we going to listen to the Holy Spirit as He leads us in those moments? And He brings us back for us, for the, to us to the purpose of helping us to live our lives that we don't necessarily die, but live. There's something that was taught to me in children's church many, many years ago, and that is what you feed grows and what you starve dies. You ever heard of that little saying? What you feed grows and what you starve dies. If I continually feed my old nature of what I was saved from, it's eventually going to continue to rise up to the spirit man inside of me eventually fades away. And I won't have a voice. The Holy Spirit won't have a voice in my life anymore. But if I listen to Him, and if I allow those things to bring Him, bring those things back to remembrance, all of those things that Jesus said, He's my teacher. As I listen to him, I'm allowing my spirit man to grow and allowing this fleshly body, this fleshly man, to no longer have his way anymore, but to honor Christ with who I am in my actions. That I treat you different. That I respond to God differently. As he's my king, and as I bend my knee to him and to his will in my life. You see, the Holy Spirit is there to indwell. He's there to lead, and it's by listening to our teacher, our helper, our comforter, all names given to him, the Holy Spirit, that we live. Helping each believer, each disciple to live by the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25. That's what he does. We can live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Live by the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Second, this morning, the Holy Spirit was given to empower. Everybody say empower. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, the passage we know as the Great Commission, Jesus told His disciples to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This was a command that He had given His disciples right before He left the earth. This was after the resurrection. Go and make disciples of all nations. I just want you to contemplate something. Jesus never chose the twelve to enjoy His presence alone. He never chose 12 men and pulled him to himself to have a powwow with them, and that's all that life would ever be. But somewhere along the lines, it was in the thoughts of the disciples that, they were, that Jesus was setting up an earthly kingdom to deliver them from Roman rule. Because Rome was the power of the day, and Rome was in control, and Rome is the one who put Jesus on the cross and crucified him. And they were thinking that Jesus was going to bring back the kingdom. He was going to bring back the rule of Israel. But Jesus never came to do those things. That was never His heart, never His plan. But somehow that was in their head. Let me, let me rule on your left and let me rule on your right. Let me do. And Jesus, He said things like, Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but give unto God what is God's. My kingdom is not of this world. He constantly reminded them of those types of things. And He was inviting them into that kingdom. In the here and now. Not some distant future. But He wanted them there, now, with Him. Allowing the Holy Spirit who indwelled them and led them to walk them through this life. But He never intended for them just to celebrate Him alone. We're going to serve. We're going to have our own little courtyard. We're going to have our own little uh, king's palace. And this is where we're all going to be. We're going to be magistrates and we're going to have fun. We're going to have our own kingdom. No. That's not how Jesus saw it. Meaning that today our sum total isn't about a celebration that we have here on Sunday morning with Him. It's not about us coming once, one day a week and gathering in a room and celebrating who Jesus is. Now we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate who He is. We're going to celebrate Him big in this room. I want that. But that's not just what we're about. It's more than that. He chose the twelve to fulfill His purposes in the world. That's what He chose His twelve for. That out of these men that I have chosen, 
that they're going to lead a revolution. That they're going to lead the church into a new place. That they are going to accomplish my purposes in the earth. What does that mean for us? That means Jesus gave them a task. The very same task that He has given us. The task of reproducing. The task of disciple making. The task of sheep replicating, if you will. That means we go into all the world and preach the gospel as, as, as Mark says. But as Matthew, this text that I referred to, we go and make disciples. We go and make disciples. Allow people to see who Christ what has done. Tell our story. What has He done in you? Tell your story. And watch the Holy Spirit do something in the life of another. Well, as I contemplate that responsibility, it's impossible. don't mean to bust your bubble today. But as we contemplate that task that God has given us, it's impossible. Think about it. There are challenges. Most disciples aren't formally trained or educated. Ah, We're just not. We're just not formally trained. Even the disciples themselves that walked with Jesus, they didn't go to Bible college. They didn't have any formal education. When they were called in front of uh, the, 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 the scribes and Pharisees, what, what did they say in Acts? I believe it's Acts chapter 4. They had recognized them as having been with Jesus. That was the difference. They recognized them as having been with Jesus. How do they speak with this authority? How do they speak? Well, one, there's the Holy Spirit in their life. And they had been with Jesus. The gospel is considered intolerant in society. Challenges. Not just in this society that we see, but even in the, in the early church's life, the, the gospel was intolerant. To the place where they were beheaded and burned at the stake and offered up on crosses. That was intolerance. In the sense of slaying the early church, we're starting to see that today. Even in our generation churches church people just don't get along as i said this morning i'm not looking at anybody we we just we sometimes we don't get along and the bible says that we're known as disciples by the love that we have for one another and if we can't get along why does church why does people in the world want to come be a part of what we do and many are focused on their own advancement rather than others we don't prefer each other we don't love each other well because it's about us i'm not condemning anybody in the room i'm just saying these are our challenges and these were the the challenges that was in the early church time hasn't changed any of that it's still there and we still deal with it how do we accomplish this great task in the midst of all of these deficiencies how do we accomplish that how does jesus expect us to take the message of this of his resurrection to the world Well, Mark Batterson, pastor of National Community Church, is quoted by saying this. Take the Holy Spirit out of the equation of my life, and it would be spelled boring. (laughs) Add Him to the equation of your life, and anything can happen. When you add the Holy Spirit to you, when you mix Him into your life, anything can happen through you. You see, what you have and what I have today isn't enough. I have to tell you that, and I love you enough to say that to you. It just isn't enough. That's why we have the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why He was given first, so that we're not alone in this journey. That He's with us, He indwells us, He leads us. But second, Jesus knew that we were inadequate for the task that He's called us to. What task is that? Living a holy life for starters, but also making disciples. Going into the world and sharing this gospel in the midst of intolerance, in the midst of lack of education, in the midst of sometimes I just fought with a person that was in church next to to me. And sometimes I just want what I want. I don't care what another person wants. How do we continually share the gospel and let them see that what God has done in me can happen inside of them? After his resurrection, before his departure, he gathered his believers, his disciples together. 
And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He said there was a baptism that was coming for them. He went on to say in verse 8, which is our text, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. This will be the result of the Holy Spirit in your life. This will be the result of this baptism, if you will, in the Holy Spirit. And then in the Bible says in verse 9, And he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus is Superman, if you didn't know. He was lifted up from the ground, and a cloud received him out of his sight, and he was gone. And what did the disciples have at that moment? Let's, let's, let's look at it. What did they have at that moment? The comfort of the helper that was given to them. He was there. It's expedient, Jesus said, that I go. If I don't go, the comforter will not come. So I have to go. So when he left, the Holy Spirit came. So they had the comforter in their presence. Two, the impossible task of being a witness of Jesus' resurrection to the world. And three, the command to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. So they had the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, that was with them as their comforter and teacher, indwelling and leading them. The task of sharing the gospel with the world and, and the ability, the asking of waiting, the command to wait for the promise of the Father. There's something that we have to realize as Jesus followers that we have to become aware of our own personal inadequacies if we expect God to do anything or do powerful things in and through our lives. Do you catch that? When I look at me, it will never be me. And it will never be you. And the Bible teaches us to come and let's anoint people with oil, lay hands on them and pray and believe for miracles. Anything that happens in your life is never from me. Because I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to offer you. There's no power in me. I'm a man just like you are. You cut me, I bleed red just like you do. I'm a man. Flesh and blood. With prone to my own selfishness. My own wants and desires. But all of that has to be measured. And all of that has to be calculated by the Holy Spirit in my ear. Saying and reminding me of who I am in Christ and what the Word of God says so that things can happen. Well, it's the Holy Spirit, this gift, that I realize that I am not enough. And I surely don't have what it takes to bring an adequate presentation of the gospel because I can't convince anyone being saved. The Bible says, unless the Holy Spirit draws them. See, Jesus knew these things. And He loved us enough to make preparation for me and you by giving us the Holy Spirit to indwell and lead and to empower the journey. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. If we're honest today, speaking in tongues for some is the elephant in the room as we reference the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We look at that particular uh, outward manifestation and we go, hmm, I just don't know. And the reason why is Pentecostal churches haven't done a good job in teaching people what the Bible says about the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've chased experience over purpose. I need you to hear me. We've chased experience over purpose. Once again, coming back to the disciples, they even wanted just to spend time with Jesus. They wanted to build an earthly kingdom. They were excited about what could be. And Jesus said, that's not what we're about at all. My kingdom is not here. And we're going to have fun when we get together, boys. It's going to be okay. And where our emotions are going to be impacted we're going to weep in the altars. We're going to cry and worship. We may kneel and feel heavy because the Spirit weighs upon us so much and we fall to our knees or we may dance a little jig or run a little bit in the sanctuary. I don't know. 
if it's given to God in the right way. Our emotions will be impacted because that's who we are. We're emotional people just like we go, yeah, at a ball game when they score in the end zone. Our emotions come to the forefront. But it's not necessarily about the experience. It's the purpose. And what we have in the church is a deficiency in lost people in our cities. Because we don't fully understand the purpose. And why the Holy Spirit was given and why it was given in the first place. And for that reason, we have people left making up their own mind what Pentecost is without fully connecting it back to the Word of God. Again, that's what makes the difference. What does the book say? Are we Bible-based this morning? What does the book say? See, when we don't understand His purpose... When we don't understand the why, it's easy to explain the gift of the Holy Spirit away. It's easy to say, well, I have no need of that, therefore, it's not something I embrace, and for some, or believe. That was for the early church, not for today. Really? Is that what your Bible says? When we don't understand it, we just push it away. Peter and the disciples, along with, there was 120 in the upper room in Acts chapter 1 or 2. And they all began to speak in an unknown language as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And the interesting thing about that passage is they were speaking in a language that were familiar to those who were visiting the city in Jerusalem at that time. And they all heard the gospel. And they came to where Peter was. And that's the day, Acts chapter 2, that he stood up with the eleven. And he began to share this Jesus with them. And Peter, in Acts chapter 2, he said to them this, repent. And each of you baptize Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I I want you to to hear this. They say, well, that was for the early church and that was for for them to draw those 3,000 people that were added to the church that day. They heard the the language, the the gospel preached or, or, or shared in their own language through the Holy Spirit moving through them in a tongue. If that was the reason for them to do that and for those people to be drawn in, then why would it be a reason for the next 3,000 to have the same gift that was just experienced? Repent of your sins and be baptized. He says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise. He goes on to say this, for the promise, this gift is for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. Have you been called to Him today? Has He drawn you to Himself as a believer? If He's called you to Himself, then the gift is for you today. That there is a gift that He has given For a purpose and a reason. Not for you to have goosebumps when you come to church and and feel touched. And we're going to do that. It's going to happen. And that's okay. It's okay. Not downplaying that at all. But it's more than just that with Jesus. He's given it to you. He's given the gift for a purpose, a reason. And that is for you to be a witness. You see, many in the church desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They just don't understand the physical evidence, the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me just ask a question that puts things into perspective. If God can do a language miracle in Acts chapter 2, can God, can God do a language miracle today? Is anything too hard for Him? Anything too difficult for him? If he did it once, he can do it again. And if it's something that he's given the church, then he will continue to give to the church. I think it's 
in here. And I, Elisa, I'm glad you're in second service with us. Her testimony that you heard 10 years. Right here, she's trying to figure it out. 10 years. But she eventually came to the end of her and came to a place of saying, God, I know that this is a gift that you've given me for a reason. Not for me to shout and dance, but for me to live my life for the glory of God and for me to be a witness in this world. And it was in that moment of humility before the Lord, the Lord accomplished what he wanted to do in her life. Just like what he did in my life and so many others who are seated in this room and even in the first service. God continues to fill people with a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because it's for today. It's for you. It's for your children. It's for your children's children. It's for as many as God will call to himself. You see, God's desire is to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's his to give. He's the baptizer. The scripture says, John the Baptist, when he was baptizing in water, he said, there is one coming after me whose shoes that I am not even worthy to bend down and unlatch. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. He will do that. So who's the baptizer? According to John the Baptist, it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. He's the one who comes and does this in your life. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell and lead your life. But he also knows that you don't have in yourself what you need to do what God has called you to do. Therefore, it's Jesus' pleasure to submerge you into the relationship with the Holy Spirit. He does that. He's the baptizer. Just like when you were baptized in water. And if you haven't, you can do that. When you go into the water, there's a submerging. And Jesus wants to do that in all things that is the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, I hope you will be baptized. He said, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Are you catching what Jesus said? Are you catching the types of words that he spoke? These are things that will happen for you, his church, for a reason. The disciples waited, and the promise of the Holy Spirit was given, displayed through a personal prayer language given by the Holy Spirit, and continues today, spoken by his disciples, spirit empowered to share Jesus with the world. You see, Pentecost or Pentecostal isn't just a label. It defines your life as simply submerged in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. A relationship that lives and walks in the Spirit to accomplish what you can't do on your own. Till the whole world knows. Till the whole world knows. Your life is not any different than my life. Well, you're a preacher. So are you. The Bible calls you a royal priesthood. A holy generation. Set aside for His purposes. You need all the tools that God has given to accomplish those tasks. And I'm encouraging you. You may have questions today about the Holy Spirit. You may say, you know, I didn't know this was a Pentecostal church. I don't don't know what's going on. It's not about running the aisle. Or hanging from a chandelier. If you notice, we removed all of ours. He's given to us for a purpose. To help us as a believer. To live and to love. But also empowering us to serve. Ask all the questions that you want. But know that the word doesn't change. And neither does the gift that he has promised. It's for you. It's for your kids. It's for your kids' kids. It's for as many as the Lord has called. Is a Spirit-empowered life your culture? I'm going to leave you with that question. Is a Spirit-empowered life your culture? If I can come back to values, show me the value. It will reveal the fruit. If a spirit-filled life is your culture, if it's your culture, 
there will be a fruit that comes behind it. Let it become your culture. Let it become who you want. If God has it, don't you want it? If God's promised it to you, don't you want it? Don't you want all that God has said you can have? I sure do. If He says you can have it, then it's already yours. You will be filled. Not hope, but you will. And that's my prayer for you today, tomorrow, and every day. Whether you have questions that you're trying to figure this out today or whether you're ready this morning and you're with hands lifted, you say, Lord, fill me to overflowing. I'm here, God, to receive. Where you just continually open yourself up to be an empty vessel to be filled. Where are you in life today? What culture are you trying to produce? What culture do you want to come from your home, your family, into your life? That's your decision. As you listen to the Lord speak to you this morning. Always your decision. Because He's always a gentleman. But He's offered all of these things to you in the person of the Holy Spirit.